Hello and welcome. I am so excited today to be able to bring you this message, uh, a message of death and a message of life. I recently went on a sabbatical. Uh, I make it a practice weekly to have a Sabbath day of rest and then quarterly to take 72 hours or two nights um, to just get away by myself and to contemplate who I have become over the last uh, quarter, over the last three months, and who the Lord is calling me to be. And that's as a husband, that's as a father, that's as a pastor, that's as a leader, as a business owner, as a friend. Um, and it's an awesome time for me to stop and reflect on on my 12-point monthly checklist where I look at different categories and I, I grade myself of how I'm doing. And one of the things that I've learned is that we we tend to care for what we measure. I think about, I know what my weight is because I'm, I'm measuring it and I'm caring for it. I know how old my children are because it matters to me to celebrate their birthday on the right year. I know when my anniversary is because it matters to me to celebrate that with my wife. And, and we measure the things that we care for. So I, I began um, last year, uh, early in the year, measuring these 12 different areas of my life. And on my sabbaticals, I get to do this. And I was just reflecting on this last one about the goodness of God over my life, the faithfulness of God over my life. I said, Lord, remember, re remind me of the, the things that I've forgotten, of how you have been faithful over and over and over again. Let me just, let me journal them. Let me write them down. Let me, let me just dial into gratitude during this time and, and allow me to carry that with me through every situation, every challenging moment um, in the days to come. And one of the things that the Lord reminded me of is a story, because I certainly don't remember it, but the day of my birth, uh, when I was born, the umbilical cord was wrapped around my neck for an extended period of time, and I was actually born with all the lowest possible APGAR scores that you can get, and was essentially, was, was dead. Um, and the, the, through the doctors, the Lord brought me back to life, and Though I don't remember this moment, obviously, the Lord was reminding me of the story as a stake in the ground that not only have I spiritually brought you from death to life, but I've actually physically brought you from death to life on the day of your birth. And when I sing these songs about resurrection power, and when I read these scriptures about the power of God through resurrection, the, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives within you. Like, all of a the sudden, these things come come to life within me, and and I just realize here that I um, I I want to glorify the Lord in gratitude through every situation, no matter what it might be. And the Bible talks a lot about about death to self, death to the old. We have to pick up our cross and follow Jesus, and we're supposed to die to our sin and to the power of sin. And I wanted to talk today a little bit about what that uh, particularly means. And I wanna give you five things, practical things that you can die to in order to walk in the anointing and the authority to which God has called you. This scripture right here, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. I wonder if, if we really have died to something. Sometimes um, when you're in church for a long time or you're in Christianity for a long time and, and maybe things have gotten a little stale, they've gotten a little religious, you kind of start going through a routine and, and things get comfortable. Comfort is a great enemy to growth. Um, because we just get, you know, when, when you're trying to build muscle, here's a great analogy. When you're trying to build muscle, you have to be uncomfortable. And if you work out with the same weights for an extended period of time, a, a few months at a time, what happens is your, your muscles get used to carrying that amount of weight. And so they stop growing. 
uh, because there's no need to assume any more muscle fibers or muscle mass to carry anything bigger. So what you have to do is about every month, you have to make sure that you're, you're ramping up the amount of weight that you're lifting so that your muscles, all of a sudden, they're like, whoa, this is more than we're used to. I don't know if we can handle this. And they begin to tear and rebuild themselves with greater muscle mass in order to carry the new weight. And our growth is the same way. It's, it's not possible for us to walk more intimately with the Lord unless we're being stretched spiritually. It's not possible for us to assume the life that God has given us unless we're willing to die to ourselves. So, so Paul is assuming here in Colossians that, hey, if your life is now hidden with God, with Christ uh, in God, then you have already died. You've died to something. And so I just want us to ask ourselves really practically today, what is it that we have died to? Have we really died to our own desires? Have we really died to, to what we want out of life? Died to you know, our vision for the future, our expectations for what God is supposed to do in our life? Have we really died to our own will? Or, or do, we, do we place our will still over other people? And I'm not talking about on occasion, obviously, we make mistakes. I'm talking about do we live a lifestyle that serves ourselves or do we live a lifestyle that serves other people, that sees the needs of others? In Galatians chapter 5, verses 24 through 25, the Bible says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now, I don't have to tell you that crucifixion is such a brutal and intentional process. It's, it's, it's a way that, that the Romans would humiliate their enemies. It's a way that they would strike fear into their enemies and, and they would use crucifixion, a dragged out extended process of killing, and they would do it consistently and constantly um, in order to, to be dominant in the region at the time. Um, so when this analogy is given, I've crucified the flesh. It means I've taken it captive. I've made it submissive to the spirit and I have intentionally executed it. And the Bible talks about doing this on an ongoing basis. And that's kind of what I want to lean into a little bit today. Since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. Let us keep in step with the Spirit since we live by the Spirit. Obedience is really an active process. And there's this idea in the church today with the word discipleship. <laughs> um, I'm reading this book right now called Practicing the Way. Um, it's, a really, it's a really powerful book about abiding in the presence of God. And one of the concepts in the book is, is what it means to be a disciple. And in scripture, the word disciple is, is always used as a noun. It's actually never used as a verb. So in the church today, we say, hey, you know, who, who is discipling you? Or who are you discipling? Or we go and we're like, hey, does this church have any discipleship programs? Discipleship is really important to me. The process of becoming a disciple is really important to me. The Bible actually doesn't speak about discipleship that way. The way that the Bible speaks about discipleship in the New Testament is very black and white. It's very binary. It's not you're being discipled or you're doing the discipling. It's very simply, you either are a disciple, you've chosen to be a disciple, or you're not a disciple. You've chosen not to be a disciple. And where we place our lordship, who we decide is gonna be in charge of our life, determines whether or not we're a disciple. So there's no process, there's no another person coming and, and trying to drag me along with them. There's no responsibility of mine to, to go and, and to disciple someone else. Our responsibility is to go and to make disciples by presenting the truth, presenting the gospel, but there's no holding hands and walking someone along. They either make a decision that they are going to submit themselves to the will of Jesus or they're not going to, and that either makes them a disciple of Jesus or not a disciple of Jesus. And and so what I want to look at today is the, the practical things that we can do according to scripture, five of them, in order to be a disciple. And here's what I want to start off by telling you. Kingdom impact requires the anointing of God. 
If you want to impact this world, if you want to impact your spouse, if you want to impact your children, if you want to impact your family, if you want to impact your workplace, if you want to impact your school, if you want to impact your community, if you want to impact your state, your nation, the world for the kingdom of God, this requires something. It requires The anointing of God just simply means the supernatural favor and ability from God to do something of eternal value that only he can accomplish by his spirit. The Bible says not by human might or by human power that the temple will be built. It's by the word and the power and the spirit of God. So if you want to make a true eternal impact, this requires, it requires the anointing of God, the supernatural favor and power of God for his face to shine upon you and grace you unto the calling to which you have been, you have been given, which is to make disciples, which is to give him praise out of the darkness into his glorious light to declare his praise, to be a priest, a, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, God's special possession. Now, the anointing of God requires the death of self. The anointing of God requires the death of self. So if you want to make an impact for his kingdom, you need his anointing. And in order to carry his anointing, you have to be an empty vessel. You can't be full of all of the trash and the things of this world. If if your hands are already full, how can you receive? If you're unwilling to let go of what you're clinging on to, how can you grab something new? Death is often looked at as um, a negative and an unnatural thing. Of course, we weren't created to experience death. Things in, uh, in God Eden, the Garden of Eden originally, were made to be perfect and perpetual and void of, of death and sickness, sorrow, pain, grief, all of these things. But because sin entered the world, death entered the world with it. But now, because of sin, there's an element of death that is actually quite beautiful. And only God can do this, take something that was desecrated and make it beautiful, more beautiful even than it originally was. And this is what he's doing with the universe right now. He's he's, he's revealing new facets of his character that never could have been known if sin hadn't entered the picture. Now we know what is his mercy, what is his grace, what is his forgiveness. We've experienced his loving kindness and salvation in ways that we never could have if sin had never entered the world. So God in his sovereignty is able to take something that that was corrupted and make it better, more beautiful, more pure than it ever was in the beginning. And it's the through the use of death that he allows this to happen. Uh, Take this for example, here's a beautiful picture. We're coming up on the fall season and I personally love the fall. But one thing that's so striking about the fall is the beauty of of death. And that death actually means new life. When you look at a beautiful picture like this, what you're actually looking at is of course death. The leaves aren't green on the trees when they're full of, of life and and chlorophyll and and getting all of the nutrients from the sun and having warmth and everything they need. It's starting to get colder and the leaves are are dying as the tree prepares for winter and then for the new season of growth and flourishing in the spring. But it can't do that, the growth and the flourishing, unless it loses its its current leaves. This is a lot like us. Ultimately, the Bible says in John chapter 12, verse 24, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. And this verse is speaking directly to like actual death. Like think of the martyrs who have died throughout history and and think of of the disciples and how their deaths were used by God to spark revival and to spark the spread of of the gospel throughout the entire known world and spark hope and and joy that these men could go to their deaths with, with joy and peace in their hearts, singing hymns to God while they're killed in these horrifying and brutal, painful ways, sparked something. But the death of self inside of you in the same way as, a, um, as an analogy 
can also spark the life of something new. The spirit can, can give you something new when you're willing to let go of something old. And let go is kind of a, a weak euphemism because really it's not let go, it's put to death. To actively put to death the things of the flesh. So I wanna spend the rest of our time today talking about the five uh, needs that you have that must be crucified in order for you to steward the anointing that God wants to pour upon you in order to change things eternally for his kingdom, for his glory, to play a part, the role that he wants you to play in your calling, your specific area of influence and to expand that and to impact more people. But it starts right within yourself. It starts right within your marriage, right within your home, right within your friend group, your workplace, your school. It expands from there. These are the five things that you must crucify in order to steward the anointing of God. Number one is the need for affirmation. The need for affirmation. We all have this naturally within us. It's not, a, it's not an inherently bad thing, but it will keep you from being able to do what God has called you to do if you have this need for affirmation from others. Let me tell you, your identity is already secure in Jesus. The Bible says in John chapter one, verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to be called children of God. Your identity is already secure in Christ. It's not like those planes, the airlines where you gotta scramble to get your seat and like run up as fast as you can and check in as fast as you can. It's more like the ones where your seat is already reserved. It's already assigned. And so you don't have to be frantic. You can go get your breakfast tacos and your coffee and cruise through the airport until the last minute of boarding and hop on the plane because guess what? Your seat is secure on that plane. It's not going anywhere. It's not changing. In the same way, your seat at the, the heavenly royal banquet feast of the, the, the wedding feast of the lamb and of his bride is secure in heaven. Your place in heaven is secure. You don't have to worry about it. You can just, you can just have, have confidence and, and authority in this life knowing who you are. You have already been affirmed by him. You have received the affirmation from the creator of all the universe, from your father in heaven, and from the spirit that lives within you. So you need to die to the need to be liked. Die to the need to be friends with everyone. Die to the need for the approval of everyone around you. I'm not talking about a mentor or a friend or someone that you, you know, highly respect and you go to for, for coaching or mentorship or wisdom or insight. I'm talking about feeling like you have to work for the approval of others. Feeling like you need the, the applause or the thumbs up from other people in order to, to have identity or to have purpose. I know men who work their entire lives and their identity becomes in their work. And their identity is, I am this, I am, I am an architect, I am an engineer, I am an artist, I am you know, this, X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. And then one day they're not able to do that anymore because their body fails them or their mind fails them or, or their career plummets in a way that they weren't expecting. And so then this crisis, I've seen this many times, this crisis you know, ensues. Who really am I? Because their identity all these years, all these decades has been in the wrong thing. I am a son of the living God. I am a prince of heaven. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I'm an ambassador for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I am his son. I am his child. Now, I do music. I, I do Bible teaching. I run a business. I do these different thing, things that I do, but those are not who I am and the things that I, that I do could change at any moment without affecting my identity because my identity is not rooted in any of those things. You have to die to the need for affirmation if you want 
to steward the anointing of God and to make an impact for his kingdom. And what that allows you to do is then be the affirmer of others. You can stand in as a representative of Jesus and affirm other people according to their true and proper identities in Christ and not in the things of this world. Number two, you have to die to, to the need to win. Die to competition. This is a tough one for a lot of people, especially the really strong leader type personalities who always want to do it the biggest and they always want to do it the best. And, and this drives a lot of people to be incredibly successful. So typically some of the most successful peoples, uh, peoples the most successful people, they have this driving need to win um, and it serves them well in many ways and it's dangerous in many others. You have to die to the spirit of comparison. Ben Franklin famously said that comparison is the thief of joy. And what you'll see for a lot of these very successful people who have this driving competition and need to win, they, they never find satisfaction, happiness, joy. You know, con contentment is the best word um, because they always need to, to have something better or something bigger. And there's nothing wrong with goals, but the idea of competition and comparison that I'm only valuable if I'm at the top. You have to die to that need. You have to die to your own expectations. What this allows you to do is to elevate other people rather than elevating yourself. Those who have not died to the need of, to, uh, to compete or to win are unable to encourage, edify, build up others because they're busy building up themselves. Do you see it? Romans chapter 12, verse three says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to be sober in judgment, honest in their evaluation of themselves, measuring themselves according to the faith that God has given. We need to be honest in our evaluation of ourselves, and there's an element of pride to each of these five things that I'm sharing, um, but it may be most apparent on the surface in this need to compete, need to win. Um, the Bible says that we have to be sober, honest, humble in our evaluation of ourselves. And when we look at ourselves and we see ourselves for who we are without Jesus and then all that Jesus has done for us, our eyes become fixed on him. We realize that we've already won because of him and we can have goals to drive us and keep us moving forward, but we have no need to compete, no need uh, to win over other people because our eyes are fixed on Jesus. So number two, we have to die to the need to compete or to win. Number three, we have to to die to the need for recognition. Man, this one is uh, tough. The need to be seen, the need to be acknowledged. Um, I, was, I was looking at a situation, part of a situation the other day, where there were these uh, three young people that were part of this event uh, that was happening, and, and one of the young people from a stage was acknowledged for their, their efforts and their energy and, and the way that God was using them, and, and as a, specifically as a representation of the next generation of Gen Alpha, and they were being praised and acknowledged and recognized because of this. And I, I had an eye on the other two uh, who were about the same age and was just watching um, their response. And their response was so beautiful and heartfelt to celebrate with that person. But in that moment, if there's a need to be recognized, then, then rather than recognizing others and building them up and encouraging them and celebrating them, then what happens is we're thinking in our own head, well, wait a second, I... I'd do the same thing. Well, wait a second, I've been here longer. Wait a second, I've put in more time. Wait a second, how does that person get promoted? Why does that person get acknowledged? Why does, why does this happen? Why does that happen? When I've been here, I've been grinding. It's the, it's the spirit of the older brother uh, in the, the story of the prodigal son uh, saying, hey, father, wait a second. I've served you all these years. I've never gone away and trashed my inheritance. And now you're telling me I'm going to have, you kill the fattened calf. You put on the signet ring. You get the royal robes for this brother. And the father's like, yes, because he was dead. And now he's alive. And the older brother was unable to see it and unable to celebrate, unable again to have joy or contentment because he was unable to, to recognize someone else. He was too busy 
having to be recognized himself. Colossians chapter three, verse 23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if working for the Lord and not for men. I wonder what things would look like in our lives if we were willing to step away from the need to be recognized and to truly invest our time, talents, and treasures for the glory of God and not the glory of our own name, our own reputation. I'm here to tell you today, every name is going to fade away. I've, I've, I've thought about this with families before where maybe there's no son and the name of the family is like, wait a second, it's not gonna be carried on because there's no son to carry on the family name and eventually that happens with every name on the face of the planet and ultimately at the last day, Every knee is gonna bow and and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and every person who's alive forever who isn't burned up in the lake of fire is going to to have a new name. The Bible says it's even a new name that's written on a white stone that only you and Jesus know. Super exclusive, super cool. But you're gonna have a new name. These old names, they mean nothing. There's one name that remains, and it's the name of Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. The Bible says he's coming back on the clouds of glory on a white horse with a sword in his mouth and fire in his eyes, leading the armies of heaven. And across his chest is a banner on which is written the words faithful and true. Jesus is the name that will last forever and it is Jesus that embodies of all the names that Jesus has, there's hundreds, thousands of names that are given to to the King of Kings. The name that is above every other name, the Bible says, is the name of Jesus. Why? Because the name of Jesus encapsulates and embodies the humility of God. And this is the one that will be recognized. So there's no need for recognition for ourselves But to humble ourselves, we're able to lift others up. Number four, we have to die to satisfaction. Die to the need to be satisfied. This has been a big revelation for me um, in my life because we work to achieve a, a state of of peace. There's even entire religion, obviously, like Hinduism. You're trying to achieve nirvana, and you're going through this cycle in, in Hinduism of reincarnation until finally you live a good enough life to stop reincarnating and be at a state of nirvana, a state of peace. Um, this concept kind of lives within all the world religions and, and within Christianity as well. <laughs> this life, it's like we're struggling, we're wrestling in so many ways to achieve peace. We think that, you know, when we're young, then when we finish school, then okay, now I'll be done. I'll be there. I'll be at a state of peace. And then we realize the challenges of the the workforce and the challenges of taxation and the challenges of just living in life and and of being successful and what that means by a worldly standard. Sometimes we become confused and, and misguided. And so we seek peace in other ways and that usually means success in a career, having enough money to buy the things that we want to buy. We think there will be peace and contentment and satisfaction in that. Um, but it's a ruse and so we think maybe by finding the right person. But then marriage proves to be beautiful but more challenging in, in most ways than it was when we were single. And it's like, wait a second, I thought that this was what satisfaction meant, but instead we're still wrestling, we're still on a journey, we're still learning, we're still being stretched, we're still growing even more than we were when we were single. And, and then it's like, okay, we have kids, and what does it mean, satisfaction? Well, oh, one day once the kids are raised and they're out of the house, and then it's, well, one day when I retire, and one day when this, one day when that. And we go to the grave with the Uh, imaginary carrot dangling in front of us, having lived our entire life chasing uh, a mirage, chasing contentment and satisfaction in, in the things of the world. Even spiritually, we think, like we have this desire to be content and to be satisfied. I'm just gonna unpack this for a minute, so stay with me. This desire to be satisfied and content spiritually But then Jesus shows us something about ourselves that he wants us to hand over to him. And we're like, ah, 
Okay, Lord, and we go through the painful work and the prayer and the fasting and the wrestling with the flesh, the crucifying of the flesh, the putting to death the things of the flesh, and then we just want to be on the other side of it, and then maybe we we do. We get on the other side by the grace of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we're like, yes, this is good. Like, I'm in right standing with God, not like to be justified, but to be sanctified in a new way. Um, justified meaning we're saved and we're given his righteousness. Sanctified mean, meaning that we're being made holy. We're looking more like Jesus every day. So now we're like, <laughs> the thing that we saw that was off, now the Lord has helped us correct it and we look more like Jesus in that way. But then the Lord shows us something new <laughs> about our attitude, about wrong thinking, about our character, whatever it might be. And and now all of a sudden there's no satisfaction again. There's no contentment. And there's this stretch and this pull to grow spiritually. Okay, listen. We have to die to the need to arrive. There is no arrival in this life. The purpose of goals is to keep us moving forward. We set goals so that we can keep moving forward, so that we can strive for something, but not to arrive somewhere. The value is in the journey, not the destination. In fact, in this life, there is no destination. Only in the life to come. If your destination is in this life, if it's a physical state of this life of my destination is to finish school, my destination is to get married, my destination is to have children, my destination is to have a successful career, my destination is to make this much money, make this name for myself, my destination is to retire, to have this house, to have this car, to go on these vacations, to wear these clothes, whatever the destination, if your destination is in this life, then this world is your home. But if your destination is your heavenly home, then you realize that this life is just a journey. It's just a journey to your heavenly home. And so you die to the need to be satisfied, either in the natural for the things of this world or spiritually, the need to to arrive somewhere spiritually and be done growing. People get to this place in Christianity and their walk with Jesus all the time. They just think they're there and they're done and the Lord wants to stretch them and grow them. They, they, they've, they're a private in the ranks of the, the heavenly army and the Lord wants them to be a sergeant. He wants them to be a, a general but they never arrive there because they're, they're thinking that they just need to be in a state of satisfaction and not be stretched anymore. The Lord wants to break what needs to be broken in order to take you to the next step in your faith, a bigger faith, a grander faith, and not to just be satisfied and content with where you are. You've got to get comfortable with the concept that you will always be stretched, that you will always be stretched. I started uh, taking cold plunges, um, man, I guess now five or six weeks ago, I started cold plunging every morning, and I started at 55 degrees and uh, for one minute, and I, I go into the cold plunge, and whoa, it was like, it's so stressful the first time, and your body's like, get me out of here, and, and you're just, you're shivering, and you're hyperventilating, and you're just fighting to get your breathing under control, and to just sit in that freezing cold water for one minute, and then you get out, and the dopamine rushes to your brain, your blood vessels open back up, and there's just all these amazing health benefits, um, and you feel amazing. And then you go to do it the next day and you're like, well, this is still like, I remember the feeling. I don't want that feeling, but you know what's at the other side of it. And so you do it for the benefit. And eventually that water doesn't feel that cold anymore. And so you lower the temperature and you extend the amount of time that you're in there. And so I've gotten down now where I'm cold plunging 37 degrees for four minutes. And um, it's still... It's still difficult to get in every single morning because you just know that it's going to be so uncomfortable. But here's the difference. I know the sensation now. I'm familiar with it. It's still incredibly uncomfortable, but I know what's coming and I know what it's like to live in that state. I know what's on the other side of that cold plunge. I know the health benefits for my body and for my mind and my muscle recovery. And so I'm willing to endure that and I'm able to endure it perpetually because I'm familiar with it. I know the feeling. And this is how it is spiritually for us as well. I know the feeling of being stretched. It's just as uncomfortable for me as it ever was for the Lord to reveal something about me in my life, in my heart, 
part in my mind, in my behavior, in my attitude that needs to change. That's, that never becomes comfortable to experience correction from the Lord, but it's familiar. And you become, just like that cold plunge, you become a spiritual veteran. You're like, ah, I recognize the hand of God. I recognize the voice of God and I say yes. I say yes to being stretched. I say yes to being changed. I say yes to being made more like Jesus. Lord, do what you need to do. Have your way. Like David said, search me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way within me and lead me to the path everlasting. That's my prayer in my life and I hope that it's your prayer and yours as well. When you die to the need to be satisfied and you you come to terms with, with the reality that in this life we are going to live in a constant state of stretching. It allows you to find peace and joy in every situation because you know the peace and the joy is not in the destination, but it it is in your attitude and your response on the journey. Philippians chapter three, verse 14 says, I press on toward the goal that I might win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I press on, I push through no matter what it is. I'm still on the journey. As long as there's breath in my lungs in this life, I am running a race and it's not gonna be comfortable, but I know what lies on the other side and it is for faith and joy and hope and peace that I run and I keep running forward until I cross that finish line. And number five, we have to die to the need for control. Die to the need to be in charge. Die to to the need for control. When we have a need to control things, it's often rooted in fear. In fact, most of the times that I've experienced this in my own life or I've seen it in those I love or those close to me or in, in situations around me, I see fear behind it. Uh, fear of, of things going a different way, fear of broken expectations, a fear of, of, of the unknown. And so people try to cling to control. Maybe it's in a marriage. Maybe it's in um, a relationship with children. Um, they, maybe it's a relationship with a friend or a significant other. Maybe it's in a job. Um, it could be so many different areas, but clinging to control. The need for control fosters manipulation and stagnation. But trust fosters freedom and growth. Do you ever notice when the tighter you try to hold something, like the more it just slips through your grip? When you try to manipulate other people in particular or situations, ultimately everything just just slips through your grip. And even if it doesn't, what you end up is with a stagnant, dead, nasty thing. Uh, We live on a creek behind our house and I know that when it's raining, when there's new life, new water coming into the creek, the creek is clear and beautiful and the water's running and it's flowing. And when it hasn't rained in a long time, the creek becomes stagnant and still. There's no movement in the water. And so what happens is algae begins to set in and the creek becomes thick and full of, full of gunk and the life just begins to, to dissipate. The other day there was a really heavy rain that came through our area and I talked with both my uh, wife and my mother-in-law that day and my wife said, man, this is, this is just a big goalie washer. And my mother-in-law said, man, a different time in the day said, this is a real toad strangler. <laughs> and I'm just not, I've been here a long time in Texas, uh, and I'm just not, the, I'm not there yet <laughs> from Virginia Beach. And as Texan as I am, there's still these things that are like so country to me, but uh, <laughs> totally beside the point. When, when that rain came into the creek, it washed all the algae out. It washed all the, the gunk and the filth and the stagnant, old, dead water out. And then there's this flow of life again. When you try to control things and manipulate things, you create that stagnant environment. But when you, when you trust, when you trust the Lord, when you trust others, those you love, your leaders, your mentors, then there is freedom and growth and life. I heard a really powerful quote once uh, that has always stuck with me. And it said, you can either have control or growth, but you can't have both. 
If you want control, you sacrifice growth. And if you want growth, you have to let go of control. The goal is to work yourself out of a job and into a calling. Whatever it is that you're trying to control, the job of being a husband, the job of being a father, the job of being a wife, the job of being a mother, the, the job of being a good friend, the job of, uh, that you have at your workplace, whatever it might be, the, the job that you feel like you have to carry this thing and bear the burden of it and, and deal with it and control it and make sure it goes the right direction. The goal is to work yourself out of that place by being obedient to Jesus and to realize what you have is actually a calling, not a job. I have a calling to be the best husband that I can possibly be for my wife, to be a source of stability for her in every situation, to be the best version of myself through the grace of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that I could possibly be for her benefit and then for the benefit of my children and to be the best father that I can possibly be, to be tough where I need to be tough and tender where I need to be tender, to be a warrior poet like David was, to be, to be the kind of father that my children want to call. They don't think, oh no, I, I, can't, I, I, I can't tell my dad that this happened. They think when they get in trouble, oh man, I gotta call my dad. He'll be able to help, that they'll know that I'll love them and be able to, to handle any situation that they've gotten themselves into, that they know that I'm not gonna smash them. I'm not gonna be bound up in my own feelings of anger. I'm not gonna discipline them ever in anger. I'm not gonna speak to them harshly, but I'll always be filled with both grace and truth the way that Jesus was, both tough and tender. That's my calling as a father. As a friend, it's to be the kind of friend that, that people don't even know that they needed, the kind of friend that has the hard conversations in love not just always trying to shoot the breeze and, and talk about the weather and a bunch of small talk, meaning how's the game, meaningless conversations, those things are fine, but to be the kind of friend that can, that can be a real support system, that can speak to the difficult things of life, that can be filled with wisdom and not get trapped in gossip and trying to make people feel better by talking negatively about the things that they're frustrated about, but to be solution-oriented instead of problem-oriented. It, that's a calling rather than just a job or a title at work, whatever it is. It's to make your boss look good, not to make them look bad and try to take their job. And this is what I'm saying. In doing this, you step, into, you step out of a job, out of a, a line item task list of responsibilities, and you step into a calling that has been given to you, that has been mandated to you by Jesus to be a representation of his love, his hands, his feet, in a lost and a broken and a dying world. The answer is to, is to look at Jesus and to say, Lord, what would you do in this situation? If you were in my shoes with this money, if you were in my shoes with this job, if you were in my shoes with these relationships, if you were in my shoes with this situation, what would you do with that money? What would you do with those relationships? What kind of attitude would you have in that tough situation? You step out of trying to control everything and being frustrated because these, there's these dashed expectations because you're not in charge of things. Big, big newsflash, you're actually not in control of anything. You just think you are, it's just a facade. You're not in control of your health. You're not in control of, a, of another person. You're not in control of your job or your career. The Lord is on the throne. And when you realize that and you place him, not just on the throne in your, in your worship and your praise and your words, you place him on the throne in your heart. You, you die to the need to control. You recognize his sovereignty. All of a sudden, now you're walking in a calling. You become a source of freedom and inspiration to others other people. Proverbs 16, 9 says, many are the plans of a man, but the Lord determines his steps. Crucify your need for affirmation, your need to compete, your need for recognition, your need for satisfaction, and your need for control. The Bible says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live I've laid down my will. I've laid down my right to live. You know why Paul was so successful during the days of the early church? Because he wasn't afraid of death. 
because he wasn't trying to survive. He said to live as Christ, to die as gain. I can't lose. I'm in a win-win situation. And with that attitude, with that perspective, completely free of fear, having died to the need for affirmation, having died to the need for competition, recognition, satisfaction, and control, he was able to impact the globe for thousands of years to come and write half the New Testament that speaks to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Even today, these words just jump off of a page straight into our hearts and into our minds and change the way that we live by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was able to do all these things because he wasn't trying to survive. He wasn't trying to, to, to extend his own life. He wanted to walk in the will and the calling and the purposes of Jesus every day. He had been crucified with Christ. He no longer lived. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I pray for you today that you will learn the value of dying to these five things that you will absorb these scriptures that I've shared with you today that the Lord has left for us in his word that you will believe them not just in your mind not just hear them in one ear and out the other that that you would that you wouldn't just look but that you would see that you wouldn't just hear but that you would listen and that you would embrace the truths of God's word believe them deeply in your spirit to let go of these needs that the enemy wants to use to cripple you so that you can embrace the fullness of the purpose to which God has called you, an eternal purpose that will shake the gates of hell and expand the territory of the kingdom forever. May God bless you today and always.